Hey, you like calls? Welcome. Welcome back. I know the last time I was doing this, I was sitting on a couch somewhere in New Orleans, New Orleans, and, you know, I was just doing a quick little video to be consistent, but it's not like my best video I did yet. So apologies for that particular episode of the podcast. If you watched it, you're probably like, this man looked like he about to just curl up on the couch and go to sleep because I was about to, but, you know, I had to do what I had to do. But today is a good day. You know, I didn't have to use my AK. <laughs> Shout out to Ice Cube. If you don't know that song, I really don't know what to tell you. You know, honestly, you should stop watching this podcast right now or listening to it and go proceed to find that Ice Cube song. Okay. Now, what are we doing? Clapper time. Episode 48. Car Quicks. Hope y'all doing good out there. Last time, you know, like I said, I was, you know, out on a little mini vacation. So I wasn't really in my humble abode, my place, my space, my zen, my, you know, abode. So I'm here now and we got something exciting to talk about. There is other news, but we're here to talk about the one particular news because that's what I want to talk about. And that's really what's the most important thing that's going to happen for probably the remainder of this week. Unless somebody announces some other very special big car that's going to come out. But you know what I'm here to do, okay? First and foremost, welcome if I haven't already said that. Shout out to your friends, your family, your kids. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing well as drive in. Okay, because we got stuff to talk about. So, you know, my fellow brothers, my brethren, those that resemble me, you know, we we've had a battle, a fight, you know, with certain cars, certain cars, certain model make. And this made its comeback for anybody that is wondering what I'm talking about. We're talking about the Dodge Charger. And it's back. Okay, and we've hinted at it. I've seen the concept back from 2019. We've seen spy shots, and there has been a division, right? There is, you know, parting of the Red Sea. There has been people on one side of the fence, others on the other side when it comes to what they think about this new Dodge Charger, and that's what we're talking about here. So today, Dodge announced or revealed, not announced, but they revealed the full production Charger, right? They showed everything about it what it's going to look like, the performance, the power, the controversial EV model. Something's flew in my eye right now. The controversial EV model and so on and so forth. And it is an all doom and gloom, right? From the onset, I said something that I particularly liked about it. And that is I'm not against anything EV, right? I think it has its place. I always say I don't think it's the end-all, be-all, but I do understand where it fits in, and it has some really, really cool things that it does in that realm and on those type of platforms. So I'm all for it, right? Technology is what I like. I work in the industry. I like to see the advancement of it and the things that are included with it. So when Dodge showed off the 2019 concept and they showed off the EV one, and I believe that variant they showed was the SRT Banshee version, and it had the... You know, frets, I can't, hold on. The name of the exhaust on the EV, and I'm putting air quotes up if you're not watching the video, it's called like the Fratzog Onik. Fratzogonic? Something like that. Because the badge on the car is called the Fratzog, right? That is the name of the badge that it has on all of the models. F-R-A-T-Z-O-G. Frat Zog. That's, I mean, that's the only way I can announce it. And so if somebody tells me to pronounce a different way, I'll be shocked. Okay. But the name of the exhaust they have on the EV had that name and they showed it off on the concept in 2019. And it, I might throw a sound clip in, I might not. It's, it was more like a, a loud cat purring, right? It wasn't a roar. It most certainly wasn't a Hemi. It wasn't a V8. It wasn't didn't have any chop. It didn't have the visceral sound of it. So it was kind of a runny joke. People saw that. Then Dodge at that point, along with many other car manufacturers, if you 
listened to my last podcast and many of the other podcasts I've done before, everybody was blazing the trail for EVs, right? They were like, we're not even going to build nothing else. Gas powered, y'all better get in line or fit in where you fit in. And it's going to be EVs. But so they had that come out, plus the idea of never having a V8, not having a Hemi. There's no more Charger wide bodies. So the overall consensus amongst the enthusiasts who own these cars and have them, who have basically put Dodge up on this pedestal, and not a pedestal, they used their money. They paid with their wallet and paid with their money and showed that they were interested in this type of car, were not technically happy about what they were seeing. Most people were like, I'm not feeling this. I'm not looking for an EV. I bought a wide-body Hellcat because it had a supercharged V8. I'm not in the market. So the CEO said that he got a bunch of emails when they announced this thing, and it was like just hate mail <laughs> flooded in there, which I was like surprising. I'm like, why y'all surprised? You knew what the market was saying. You knew the energy around it. But there was a side of some people like myself that were like, listen, I understand this isn't technically where I wouldn't necessarily go myself, but... I do appreciate the the electric side of it and the technology, and I can get behind it. I'm sure it's going to be fast in a straight line. That's for certain because EVs are very good at that. Instant torque, instant power, power down, go, single speed transmission or two speed, and we're going on our way. So in when that got released, you had that division. And as time went on, they started talking about what it's going to look like. They show spy shots of the chassis. And at that point, there was rumors circulating that there was going to be a Hurricane Inline 6 inside of the car, right? The Hurricane Inline 6 was already sitting in one of their trucks, the Ram TRO, and it makes about 400 and something horsepower, maybe near 500. But there are variants that get up to 500. There's a race one that's somewhere in the development cycle in the, you know, catacombs of the Dodge, you know, chambers of development that is said to produce up to a thousand or hold more than that. We don't know what that model is, but the Hurricane Inline 6 is a forged internal motor. And from the sounds of it, and from what some people have said or spoke to about the engineering, it's a very stout motor. And so when they showed the chassis with the ability to have that engine in it, the room was spun up again saying, okay, maybe they're going to throw in an engine and we're not just going to have only EV. Then later on down the timeline, the CEO and Stellantis and those people started kind of easing off of the EV bandwagon. I don't want to say bandwagon, that's a bad word. Bandwagon is a term I want to use. They were on heavy on the EV train, but they started having different stops because they realized that this train has to gradually get to its destination of what they're looking for. So people started backing out. You had other manufacturers say, hey, we're not full-fledged, only EV. Companies like Mini say, we're going to give you an EV version of the new Mini and a gas ice-powered one because we need you know, what they call the power of choice. And Dodge did the same thing here. They actually gave the power of choice. Those rumors were true. There is an ice gas powered version of the new Charger, and there's an EV one. This was the smartest option they had. One that they said was always going to be the case from the very beginning, though they probably messed up with the marketing and the language that they put out by only showing the EV, which whenever the companies do this that are this big, I always laugh because I'm like, you didn't have nobody on that email thread that said, hey, guys. You may not want to say it's only going to be EVs if we know we're going to put an engine in it. You might want to tell them that there's going to be a gas power one too. And it's also not a weak motor, even though it's an inline six and it's not a V8. I don't know why they want to say that. Like they did all that for the EV just at the end to be like, see, we told you we were going to do this from the beginning. It's like, okay, if you were, how come you didn't tell me that I could get, you know, sauteed onions on my burger on the front of the menu? Why you tell me at the end, I thought I already made my decision. I'm not going to buy one because you ain't got it. You see what I'm saying? You got to give people their options up front. So today, all the information came out. I'm sure you've watched YouTube. You've seen videos of people standing in front of the Dodge Charger talking about it. I was not invited. Okay. I'm not big enough yet. You know, they look at the numbers and the subscribers. I'm not there yet. I got the personality and I could talk well, but I wasn't invited yet okay soon enough i'm gonna be there in front of them cards with my hands folded saying this is the 2025 whatever model card is or 26 or whatever it may be it's gonna happen give me my time okay all good things come in due time okay i'm just getting started now here's what they talked about right as you know 
the original Charger and the Challenger has been around basically in the same form since like 2006. We have been about 20 years on the same chassis. So please, my fellow brethren, we got to move on. Okay, I know those that are currently driving 2023, the last model year, wide body chargers and challengers and hellcats and red eyes and demon 170s original demons y'all are in an extremely unique spot because you got the last of the mohicans when it comes to that model that build those prices i said it before will proceed to go up especially now when you know we're not really coming back to that anytime soon it doesn't look the same it's not gonna have the same motor there's an illustrious version of it so if you're looking for the last of the more analog especially if you want a manual six-speed manual because you ain't getting one the new one unfortunately then you're looking at those models so the people that own those models i understand them being vocal saying i don't want them keep in mind excellent because you have an excellent vehicle and why so have gotten it if that's the one you wanted but we got to move on, okay? It's been 20 years. I mean, like, the chassis got to change. And so they changed it. This time, though, we have a two-door and a four-door, and it's only car charger. The Challenger name is somewhere being put to rest, not permanently, but for the moment now has been tabled to the side. I'm sure they're going to bring that name back out somewhere, somehow. Hopefully, they don't slap it on the back of an SUV because, listen, while they may have done good on the redesign in the next direction of the Charger, in my eyes, they could very well do away with all the good by saying, listen, the next Challenger is actually an SUV. And I'd be like, you know what, guys? You failed again. Now, what do we got? There's going to be a two-door and a four-door version of the Charger. Now, you see it floating on the screen. This looks extremely good. Okay, I said it before. It looks good to me. I know this is all opinion, subjective. But the way this looks, it looks better than what they showed us back in the day in 20, 2006, 2008, when they kind of refreshed it and stuff like that. This looks more true to what the Charger looks like from the classic muscle cars than even the version that's technically out now, save for like the Challenger, because that kind of went closer to that. But this looks extremely true to the classic one. Very retro, very, you know, future. Some people say it looks kind of sedated, mundane, but. I mean, the original Charger, for just hard, going back to the original classic, didn't really look that like in your face bold. The current one that's out now, the last of the wide bodies, kind of had a more presence, so to speak, because it had the flares on it when it came to the way the fenders look. This one is all molded in, looks wide, but I like this even better. It's muscular. I can see the stands. I can see the rear quarter panels. I can see the front end. I can see the front grille. I can see the new frat zog, you know, emblem on the front and the rear. I like how this looks. The LED strips around the front of the grille and the rear. This looks good. This lowered set of wheels. I know I'm getting into my aftermarket modify everything bag. That's just how I am. But this proper wheels lowered, meaty tire stance. I mean, mwah fire there's no way this won't look good i mean it's guaranteed to look good i've already seen a mock-up from the company hre wheels and i'm like listen we only a few set of coils and lowering springs or airbag set up for this looking absolutely magnificent it already does now in stock form but let's continue on with what really is going on let's just start off with the electric charger because that has the most specs we're going to jump to the speckies okay we're going to jump to them there are two versions that are coming out that are starting their production in 2024. So mid-year up in the Windsor plant in Canada is where we're going to be building these electric chargers. The first variant is the RT. It's a 496 horsepower, 404 foot-pound torque model with an option called PowerShot that adds the extra 40 horsepower to bring it to 496. Without this PowerShot option, it's 456. What this does is like a boost feature. For 15 seconds, you hold a button on the steering wheel, you get an extra 40 horsepower, and it has to reset every 30 seconds to basically probably cool off the batteries, probably regenerate some from the braking that you're going to be doing, obviously, when you're blasting off like this. And then there's a second version, the Scat Pack one. This has 670 horsepower but also with the included 40 horsepower power shot option is 630 without it 627 foot pounds of torque the same feature with the power shot right i guess that is one thing that i've noticed from the articles i read that dodge is introducing to all these models is that it has this like boost feature which is 
I'm sure they're going to play it up like it's NOS, right? Where you can press the button and go, which is cool. I mean, honestly, I don't know what it does to the battery. I'm sure if you use that enough times in a row, you probably will reduce your range and reduce how much capacity you have left over the time because of what is used and how fast it's discharging the power. Each variant of the EV charger, RT or the SCAD pack has a 100.5 kilowatt battery. It's all wheel drive. We're going to get more on that later. 400 watt, 400 volt electrical architecture, 0 to 60, 4.7 seconds for the RT, which is decent. I mean, listen, GR Corolla can, uh, can get busy with him. Or 3.3 seconds for the SCAT pack, an 11.5 second quarter mile for the SCAT pack, 13.1 on the RT. And they all have this ability to discharge the power extremely fast. 550 kilowatt discharge, which... In non-technical layman terms, what that means is the faster the discharge, kind of the faster it can disperse the power and increase the performance of that said car. 550 is considered from what I've read or what I have been reading on EVs over the you know months and years is that that is on the high end of it. Usually around 320 is considered very good. 550 means it has a very efficient amount of discharging so that it can be consistent when it comes to the power. That is what Dodge is aiming for. They want people to take it to the track, drag race it, and consistently have the same number and time every time they go. Similar to what Tesla shows off with the Plaid or like the Cybertruck where they said, I can run this number back and forth multiple times and it stays consistent. We don't have this degradation on performance because the batteries are too hot or it runs out of juice. And I know Tesla is good for doing that well. And I know companies like Remock with the Nevera hypercar. So we're going to see what Dodge does. I would assume that they know that somebody's going to put that to the test, right? Because that's the big thing. They want to see what this thing can do. It's not as fast as a Plaid. It's definitely not as fast as a Lucid Air um, Sapphire. But I would imagine that the other last model for the EVs, the high-performance SRT Banshee version, that is the one that's going to be the top of the pile. And that one has an 800-volt electrical architecture, a two-speed transmission, similar to like the Porsche Taycan, a drag mode as well. And the rumors are that the power on that is north of a 1,000, probably. When you look at the numbers, when you think about what they're trying to do, especially if you're considering how much they're going to try to get people to win people over, Listen, a thousand horsepower is a very good conversation starter. And that's what EVs are known for. I've said it before. I mean, sometimes it's a little extreme when they put a thousand in family sedans or, you know, SUVs. But on a Charger EV with a drag mode and big wheels and tires and all wheel drive, that makes perfect sense. I mean, like, listen, go all the way. One of the interesting things that they talked about was that the Daytona name is going to be on the back of all of the EV versions of the Charger. I'm assuming the regular ice power ones, when they get released, will probably just say Charger. And so you know the difference. The electric ones will say Daytona. The 800-volt architecture one is coming out later in 2025. They haven't said when that's coming out or how soon it is. But 2025 either can be at the beginning, middle, end. But that year is when you're going to see the SRT Banshee version come out. And that is what I said is going to have probably well north of a thousand horsepower. It has the drag mode, the two speed transmission, and it said it has the ability, ability to change gears, like multiple gear changes. I don't know where that plays a role. Maybe they simulate gear changes inside the software, even though it's only a two speed transmission. Maybe it holds the power in different intervals of shifting to make it feel like it's changing gears, similar to what Hyundai did on the Ionic 5N. They did the same like transmission shifting type of thing. Listen, <laughs> if we already got like a instrument trombone type exhaust system, them trying to emulate shifts and have the car maybe hold back some of its torque, kind of feel it moving back and forth when it's shifting. I mean, it's in the gimmicky side of things, but at least they're trying. They're trying to engage you somehow. They could just very well throw us in there and say, hey, listen, it's a one speed, hit the gas, you know what it's going to do. So having some fanfare with it, I'm not against. I mean, yeah, it can be kind of kind of gimmicky, kind of cheesy, but hey, sometimes cheesy can be fun. Sometimes you need a little bit of cheese on something. I mean, I don't know. Now... The main thing that happens with EVs that is going to be somewhat of a concern, I would say, is the weight. 
Listen, the Chargers were already whales. I mean, the EV one's the Megalodon. I mean, this thing is a beast. It weighs 5,835 pounds without a passenger. Okay, let's, let me say that again. 5,835 pounds. That's a monster. Okay, so it's heavy. I mean... EVs are heavy. Like I said, we haven't had a revolutionary change in batteries, and batteries are heavy, especially when you stack them, especially when you increase the voltage system. I don't know if the Banshee version will be heavier. I would almost imagine they would probably try to make it lighter, maybe throw some carbon fiber somewhere in there, lighter aluminum or something to try to reduce the weight, because if the 800-volt system on the Banshee is even more batteries and it weighs 6,000-plus pounds, I mean, that's going to be part of the headline, them saying this thing weighs 6,300 pounds and it does 0 to 60 in two seconds. You know, like, what brake system are we putting on these things, okay? Because it needs 10 pistons. So 5,000, near 6,000 pounds dry with people. I mean, you're over 6,000 pounds. The range for the RT model is 317 miles per charge. The R scat pack is 260. Now, remember I told you about the power boost option when you press the button and they're giving you 40 horsepower, you know, for every 30 seconds or for 15 seconds and cooling down for 30. I would guess that that range is going to change somehow. Like as you're driving the car and you're doing that, having fun at the cars and coffee, trying to peel out of the driveway, not spinning out and killing yourself. I'm sure that range goes down. But 317 isn't terrible. 260 is low in the in the realm of evs but this ev specifically the charger ev is not aimed at high level traveling efficiency this is still being marketed as a sports muscle type car so they get some grace when it comes to the range if this was i don't know a Toyota Camry, and they said it only gets 260 miles per range on a charge on an EV, folks would say that's not good enough. So similar to like the Model Ys and Model 3s that are pushing past 340, 350, even though those do still get around the 250 range, Dodge and the Charger isn't going to be held accountable or held to the fire of like, your range isn't good enough. You know, they're just about performance. The charge times are said to be 27 minutes between 20 and 80% if you're on a level 3 DC charger. Now, for all those ideas that they give out, if you're not on this type of charger, then this charging rate is going to be whatever it's going to be at whatever random Charge America at their local Macy's parking lot that you're in and whatever they're going to charge it at. So I don't really rest too much on that number because that's the most ideal situation about how fast you can charge this car from low percentage to at least high percentage. Now, there is an interesting aspect or they talked about, which is going to be controversial to probably what I say is the top speed. They said the RT model is 137 miles and the scat pack is 134. That's low. Now, I know somebody's going to say, yo, the speed limit is 65 miles an hour, my guy. Take it to the track. Even if you do take it to the track, 134 miles an hour on a track, not that Dodge Chargers and Challengers are known to be track weapons, because they weren't. That's still kind of low. I'm not, I'm, I really can't even, I can't lie. That's low. I would imagine it should have been around like 150, 160, just for the sake of the marketing and the ideas of muscle cars fast. I mean, the current outgoing charges and challenges now are much faster than that. I know we're talking about top speed. I know I'm talking about using that in a very controlled environment. And people are going to say, how many people are touching this top speed? <laughs> I'm telling you now. Now, 134 folks are going to be touching constantly, okay? That's not as crazy as it may sound on paper. I'm not going to dive any further into why I say that, but just saying 134 and 137 on these probably $80,000 scat pack EVs, it's kind of low. That's what I'm saying. It's low. I'm sure they can be faster. I'm sure they might change it up. I'm sure you can probably tweak some things later on that somebody will try to modify, jump into the computer and change that number. But it is heavy. So, yeah, it can go faster if it does, but you're still driving around in a brick house. Later on, there's going to be a single speed, single speed. There's going to be a single motor version with 335 horsepower, 300 foot pounds of torque, 314 foot pounds of torque. And that's going to be a real wheel drive only model. So they all have all wheel drive. 
the gas power, the ice power, the EV, which I think is awesome. I'm an all-wheel drive car myself. Listen, the joys of all-wheel drive are tenfold, right? You can drive in bad weather. It handles better in the rain. It has grip off the line. And yes, you can have them handle well. I may not be as... It may not be as engaging, snappy when you're driving as like a real wheel drive Porsche or some other vehicle like that, like a Corvette that has that character in the turning and the twisting of the chassis, how it feels rotating. I understand. This thing also weighs near 6,000 pounds. Listen, we need all wheel drive. Okay? 6,000 pounds in real wheel drive. When the back end steps out, it's over, dog. It's done. If you are in Jeff Gordon at the wheel, when the back end of 6,000 pounds steps out, I don't know what to tell you, okay? You better be Samuel Hubinet when he was drifting in Vipers back in the day, okay, to get busy with this. Then there is a drive, there are drive modes. There is a mode that allows you to remove the torque from the front axle to the rear so you can do a burnout and probably do some donuts because Dodge, they know all their commercials and the, you know, burnouts and the donuts, they can't take that away. I mean, if you can't do that in the electric one, then it's like, what's the point? We lose even more of the muscle. We don't got the sound. We don't got the rumbling and the chop and the shaking of the engine unless I hope they don't try to like add some suspension mode where the car is shaking when it's idling because <laughs> that'll be absolutely ridiculous. But listen, Crazier things have happened. So I know that those modes matter, and they matter for the takeovers. <laughs> listen, listen, the instant torque, drag mode, big weight. Listen, kids, if you see one of these at a takeover that you shouldn't have been at anyways, and it's trying to do a rollback, even though that you know you lost control, but we call them rollbacks now. I would I would hope that y'all understand that when one of these y'all already getting hit by Altimas and 350Zs and whatever chargers and flying in the air planking 6000 pounds hitting you on the side some y'all just going to die. <laughs> I mean, listen, if you don't take this to the takeover, okay? But I know somebody will. So what am I going to say? You know, I I can't stop them. Now, off to the ice powered one, right? So the party isn't done yet. So there's no more Hemi. Okay? The V8 has been laid to rest. It's been taken out back, out to the pasture, Q in, boys to men, okay, into the road. It's been a good run. It's been an amazing run. Will they continue to make the Hemi like a crate engine? Probably. I mean, they got plenty of racing programs and plenty of people that are buying them. So, and if you got a Hellcat now, I mean, you already are well checking on it every afternoon because you know that these get stolen left and right like bags of chips from the corner store. So if you got a Hellcat now, and when these come out, folks are going to want to do the Hellcat swap. So I just, you know, listen, you already got to look over your shoulder now with the Hellcat or a Charger or any of those things. Listen, if you got one when these come out, keep checking because somebody is swapping this Hurricane Inline 6 out, even though I say it has a lot of potential. I mean, I come from the Japanese side of it. So, you know, seeing turbos and tuning and things like that, I'm like, listen, there's a lot here. And I may not be as stout or it may not be as known as the current supercharged V8. They figured out what it can do with weak points and strengths and its weaknesses. And for this engine, we got time. So for the RT model, it got four, it has 420 horsepower. And for the scat pack, it has 550 horsepower. They didn't talk about the torque numbers. Given it's the turbo. 420, probably around 380, 370, the 550, 420, maybe 450. I don't know. I'm making I'm making educated guesses here. I don't know how much torque they're gonna have. Both of them have a set an eight-speed ZF automatic transmission. <sighs> There's no manual. I mean, if you ever wanted to win back even more of the crowd that feels like you've left them high and dry with this current version of the charger and what the future holds. It would have been bringing the manual back. And so I just send out a little bit of a petition like, listen, Dodge, is it really that hard to throw a little bit of a six speed Manny? And I know only one percent of the people are going to buy it because that's always what happens. But I mean, 
Save the manuals. Now, outside of that, there is no rear-wheel drive on any of the charges I said before. They're all-wheel drive, including the ICE one. And this also has the same line lock. It has a line lock mode on this one, which allows you the same way to move the torque to the rear, spin the rear tires and heat them up for the drag race. So you still can do a burnout. You still can go to your takeover. You still can go do a donut. You can still spin out. You can do a rollback. I don't think they're taking any of that away because while some of it is kind of reckless endangerment activities on the street, their commercials and everything talk about this because that's what is known about muscle cars. Like, let's be real. We're doing they're doing burnouts, even though coffee and cars in my city in Houston, they're going to ban them again. So <laughs> maybe they'll let the EV ones in because they're all wheel drive. They'll be like, y'all are kind of cool. You're quiet. You're chill. We might let them ease in. They might let the charger EVs in, but them regular gas power guys, y'all out of here. So you can do line lock. The Hurricane I inline six is a forged internal engine. That's 9.5 to 1 compression, 28 PSI. There's a lot of potential. Like I said, there is a race version that they're working on. I don't know the full development of it. There are rumors of what it can handle as far as power. There's rumors that the one that's now out in the TRO Ram can handle a thousand horsepower or 900 or whatever the number is. There's a lot of potential there. What can the transmission hold? That's to be seen, even though the ZF1 might be the same one in the current model. And it could probably hold a lot of power as well, too. But the thing that I like about this is that it opens up that tuning world, E85, over the phone tuning. And you get a lot of new companies and you probably get a lot of new players too. A lot of the people that like tuning and turbo cars may lean into this new charger. And you might get a whole new demographic of people that are buying into the charger and tuning it and trying to set it up and modify it and things like that. I like what this is, especially if the RT one has 420 and the Scat Pack has 550, it's the same engine. So the only difference we're talking about may be boost pressure, hopefully. I mean, they very well could say that the 550 horsepower one has maybe some special sleeves or something else that has changed on the motor that would make it not as potent in the 420 horsepower one as a 550. But if these are identical engines and the only thing that changed was the tuning, then that means you are going to see RTs everywhere and people saying, listen, I'm not spending the money on the scat pack. I'm just going to grab the RT one and I'm going to boost up the pressure. Now, one of the things that they said on the scat pack that was available is a track pack. Now, I don't know if that's available on the RT. If it is with the same motor, you know what's going to happen. We're saving our money. <laughs> We're getting the RT with the track pack and I'm going to put up the power so I can match whatever's in the scat pack. Now, the track pack includes, you know, big six-piston Brembo brakes, 16-inch rotors, different wheels, different tires, probably different front lip spoilers where you can see that it is a track pack on it. They didn't go through the details on that particular thing, but they just mentioned that there is a track pack that is available on any of the scat pack models, EV or ice-powered. Other things on the outside that they're adding is there's nine different wheel designs. I don't know what they look like or if I would throw them up on the screen, but new nine wheel designs are coming between 18 and 20 inches. Like I said, the optional track pack includes also Eagle F1 tires and 305 up front and 325 in the rear. That's some beefy tires. Okay, that's some meat on there. Pause. Okay, there's a lot happening. So they know you need the grip, even though with all-wheel drive, I do find it interesting that's not a square setup. And that might be due to how it's handling because, you know, you want sometimes you want a small width in the front to have better feel of how you drive and the turning. But I am interested in seeing why it's not a square setup. And that might just be because of how the car is designed. It goes wider towards the rear. So the rear probably has a much wider. And they probably maybe wanted to emulate that look of wide real, rear wheels so it looks like it's rear wheel drive. But it's all wheel drive. I don't know. What I do know is that the aftermarket and the people that grab these cars, once they figure out that maybe 325s can fit all around, they're going to put them all around, okay? Because they just want a square setup. I talked about the brakes already from Brembo. And listen, like I said before, the EV version is the Megalodon on weight, okay? It's near 6,000 pounds. The ICE version, I don't, do not know the weight. It has to be at least 1,000 pounds under, I would imagine somewhere around 4,400 pounds because without those batteries and the system they need, it's a lot less weight. It could very well be very close, but I mean, I don't even, I'm willing to bet that it's nowhere near 5,000 pounds. It's probably somewhere around 4,400, 4,300 to 4,400. Well, let's just drop it down lower. I'll say 42 to 4,400. 
And that's me being conservative. I feel like it could even be less than that. But I know they're not dropping into the magical 3,000 pound weight because it's still a big car. Mm-hmm. Independent rear suspension. We have independent rear suspension, multi leak front. There's multiple dampening options when you have the drive modes on there. They didn't speak about the drive modes other than me hearing about a drag pack, a drag mode. The line lock and the, you know, burnout options and being able to spin the wheels independent of the front is more of like a program probably for that quick little 30 seconds to do that. I don't think they're going to have you hold it and last for that long and just do a whole burnout and just, you know, burn out the tires. But maybe they will. Maybe they might feel like they're going to continue to introduce that muscle car era into it. But what about the interior? So the one thing about what I like a lot about this car is that it looks just like the concept, right? The interior is about 95% there. It has a 10.3 inch driver display with an optional 16 inch display on top of a 12.3 inch display. (laughs) You know, when you walk into Best Buy and y'all see that back wall with all the TVs on it, that's your front end now. That's your dash. Okay. Cause where are we sticking a 16 inch display in front of the driver with 12.3 inches And y'all said texting was distracting (laughs) because we got 16 inch laptop screen in front of me. I'm sure it's more elongated, so it's not like a square 16 inches. But anyways, listen, that Best Buy TV wall you got on your dashboard now. Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, you know, the, the same. This is all the standard accoutrement. There's an NFC phone key option in case you don't want to hold the key in your hand. But, you know. I mean, if there's no key in my hand, how am I going to show people I got the red key? You know I mean? Like, I, I got to show them the red key. <laughs> Let them know I got the Banshee outside. <laughs> or or whatever version they make on the ice one. I don't. They didn't mention that there was going to be a bigger SRT model on the inline six Turricane, the twin turbo motor. But if they're making a SRT version on the EV, I hope they don't just make the SRT version on the EV, only that one. I do hope that they make even another higher output version of the 550 horsepower, maybe 750 or 850 to jump ahead of the last outgoing models of the Charger and the Challenger and make a version for the, for the Ice Power one too. So I don't know what the name of that one would be. SRT Banshee on the Ice one? Are they going to come up with SRT Challenger, Charger? I don't know. They're going to come up with another name. But, I mean, I, you got to have the red key. Flat bottom steering wheel. The drive mode selector on the steering wheel. There's also pistol grip shifter for the automatic transmission, which I think looks really cool. Even though it's not a manual, still looks cool. Electronic interior door opening, which they said was like a big deal, which I was like, doesn't the Corvette have that or had it since like the C5 or the C6? I mean, that's just a little button, no handle, just opens the door, nothing crazy. The seats are substantially better than what's out in the current ones, even though the current ones are comfortable and they do look decent. But these are more of a sports race-inspired high back seat with the pass-throughs for harnesses. I highly doubt many people are going to be trying to run harnesses on this particular vehicle because the Charger was never a track weapon. It was a drag track, drag strip weapon. Rep, I can't even speak. It was on the drag strip, okay? <laughs> But it was never really at Laguna Seca, okay? That's what I mean. You get the idea. So you have that option. Leather can be replaced by the cloth and a vinyl. And it's a hatchback. Round of As a hatchback owner, I applaud the hatchback design. I might just trade in. <laughs> nah, I still love the GR Corolla. Stop playing. But it is a hatchback version. Now you get 38.5 inches of cubic space. Um, It has a frunk in the front on the EV, which has an additional 1.5. I don't know how much people cared about the storage and charges and challenges, but hatchback version with the ability to have an all glass roof. Like I said, this thing looks dope. It looks good. It's a hatchback design. I don't know where we can hate when it's looking this clean, but I'm sure some people are not going to like it. And they're definitely not going to like the hatchback. They're going to be like, I wanted a trunk. You can't make everybody happy. I mean, people were complaining about the fact that it was an EV, and then they found out that it had an ice gas-powered version, and then were mad again because it wasn't a V8. So I was like, listen, ain't ain't no winning. People are just not going to accept the fact that we're changing something moving forward. And change sometimes can be hard. It can be a bit 
annoying, especially when it comes to cars you love, knowing that that's it, especially if you wanted to buy the car because you know good and well that the market is going to go nuts. And if you aren't in the market now to buy one, the market later is not going to be any better. So it's never like the greatest time. But the seats fold flat, like I said, in a hatchback. You can store a bunch of things. If you go into the track, go into the drag strip, you can put an extra spare tires in there and actually fit them. Because in a previous Challenger, people had to bring in a trailer. But now you might be able to put all the tires in there, all your tools, go to the track, do what you need to do, and come back. So it's efficient now. And that's on the EV or the ice-powered one. So you got options. You also get a heads-up display because the Uconnect system now is going to have plenty of driver modes. They didn't show what they look like or any of the extra graphics that are going to show on the screen, but rest assured, they are going to have a good time making all types of video game graphic style displays and looks all over this whole thing because that is how the EV one is going to lean into. It's going to lean into the tech side of it. The Ice Power one, probably a little bit so, but the EV one is going to be where they put a lot of the more technical looking and flashy displays and graphics on the Uconnect system. And it might trickle into the regular Ice Power one. I don't know yet. But what I know from EVs is that that's usually how they lean. And if you're privy to the EV model, you also can benefit from the fact that all those rebates on electric cars, the $7,500 credits and all that, it applies. So you might see a bunch of leases and people say, listen, $7,500 off, off this price tag. We do not know the price tag. I would imagine 60 to 80 grand for the EV and probably the same for the ice power one, maybe high 50s to mid 70s, but these are not going to be cheap, right? None of these are going to be the cheapest thing in the world, but that was never the point, right? If you want cheap from Dodge, I mean, they got caravans, they got, you know, other things that you can buy, right? Not the Charger. That's always top of the pile, muscle sports car, so it comes at a price point. And I'm excited. I look forward to it. I can't wait to see you driving them. I can't wait to see it on the road. I know for certain I'm going to see plenty in the city of Houston, okay? That's a guarantee. And I look forward, like I said, driving one. I want to drive one. I love how it looks. Would I own one? Would I buy one? Listen, if I had the means to have other vehicles and multiple ones, absolutely. I would absolutely get the Hurricane Inline 6 one. I might even consider the EV one. I'm not opposed to it, especially that Banshee one that comes out. I like what they're talking about they're going to do. It's exciting. Now, before I wrap this up, because I've been talking for a minute now. You got a long podcast this time because I was excited about the Charger information. And listen, there's more coming. The more and more news that comes out for it and when they test drive it, we're going to come back here and talk about it again. But GR Corolla update. So I'm at this crossroads when it comes to the car, right? Not a crossroads of like, am I going to keep it or am I going to get rid of it? I'm at the crossroads of what to do aesthetically, right? One side of me loves what Varus or Versus or Verus Engineering has done with the, they have a splitter kit for the GR Corolla, very track-esque looking with little splitter rods and they have a rear diffuser. And I like that look because I have an idea in my head using that front splitter with certain side skirts and I have the vision in my head. But then a couple days ago, Mr. Trey Kyoto, not I said Trey Kyoto, Treyoto, Mr. Rocket Bunny himself, Pandem, announced the GR Corolla Wide Body Kit. And oh my goodness, this is not for everybody. Let me be perfectly clear. You see it on the screen. This is extreme. This is wild. Most people do not want to chop up a car to do any of these Rocket Bunny kits. Some people hate them. They don't like the Liberty Walk kit, but I don't care because. I know that I always enjoy the wild aspect of the JDM scene. The wide body kiss, the air ride, the lowering, the big wings, the track look. I love it. And when I saw this, I haven't been able to shake this out of my head this entire life. It's been like four days. I've been thinking about this constantly. I haven't had a dream about it. And I'm like, should I go all the way wild? Like, because why am I being conservative for what? 
I've done clean car builds, you know, I've had S2000s and WRXs. Everybody does a clean build. A lot of it is because when you're on the forums and people have opinions, they don't know how to separate the fact that somebody's just going to have a different opinion from you, but it's not going to affect your life. So everybody now, nowadays, when you talk about the scene and car scene, you have plenty of people that say the car scene's dead. It's not alive. It's dumb. The takeover's killed. The kids don't care. And they have a point because a lot of times now when you see car builds as following the trend of what people are doing, nobody's going to step outside of the box that far. The few people that do, the ones that kind of rise to the top and somebody says, hey, you did something really different. I like it. But when you do something really different, you're going to have a division. You're going to have a hard yes or no. Rarely are people going to sit in the middle. They're going to say, hey, if you like it, I love it or I'm for each their own. But they're not really going to like it, especially with a wide body kit on a GR Crow like this one. This is extremely aggressive. And it's not. And when I say practical, I don't me. I don't really use those terms because what's practical if you're modifying outside of a car? I mean, like what's practicality? Practicality is keeping it absolutely stock and don't change anything. The moment you change anything, whether it's a simple lip kit, lower it. I mean, your practicality is going to be put into question because why are you changing something? But I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'll talk about this more later on another episode. But right now, that's resting heavy on my mind. Enough to think about what do you need to do in order to fund such a thing? Do I do that in a way to get to the SEMA Auto Show? Because that'd be an awesome storyline, okay? Do the GR Corolla crazy build, take it to SEMA, do something awesome. Listen, we're only here on Earth for a short time, not a long time. I recently had my birthday, so maybe I'm thinking about that. You know, as time goes on, are you going to do the things you said you're going to do, like this podcast, this YouTube video, and all the things I've done on the car so far, was me answering that call of like, hey, do what you said you were going to do or want to do, because listen, what's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work. It fails. I decide to not go wide body, just get the front lip kits and all that. But everybody's going to have that, right? I don't know. What I do know is that I'm done talking, <laughs> okay? Long episode. The Charger's out. I'll talk more about the GR Crawl and this Pandem Rocket Bunny kit later because I'm, it's, who knows? I'm not going to say anything yet. Everything can change at the drop of a hat. But the Charger's here. It's awesome. I like it. I hope you do too. I'm sure you're going to read about it. But in between then and on the next episode, do as you wish and do as you may. It's Cameron Biggs, your host. This is another episode of Car Quicks. I'll see y'all around. Peace.